Um, so I'm Stephen Leckie. I'm a spine surgeon with Plymouth Bay Orthopedic Associates. I've been with the practice now for over nine years. Uh, I'll be talking about adjacent segment degeneration after spinal fusion. So adjacent segment degeneration means after someone has had a fusion, either a cervical or a lumbar fusion, they present again some number of years later with the next level above or below having worn out and needing a second operation. And it's one thing if that operation, if your, your first operation lasted several years or several decades, but occasionally these people will come back early. And so it's very discouraging if your perfect L4-5 fusion comes back one or two years later with a massive L3-4 disc herniation requiring repeat surgery. The patients are not that happy. And so I wanted to look at this topic a little bit more closely because of all of the other long-term problems that we sometimes have with fusions, um, a lot of those problems have been solved. So non-union, which means failure to fuse, failure of the bones to weld together, that got better. We got better bone graft, we got better implants. And so problems that we used to deal with in the past, we don't really have to deal with quite so much. Hardware malposition problems, nerve injury problems, all of those things have been significantly improved upon based on technology. But the one area where we really haven't made a lot of progress uh, in the last several years is on this adjacent segment degeneration problem. And so it remains the one, if someone could fix this problem, then we'd really be in great shape. So adjacent segment degeneration after spinal fusion adjacent segment degeneration specifically mean is a radiographic finding. So MRI, CAT scan, or X-ray showing an intact fusion and then the next level above or below having worn out, developed narrowing of the spinal canal, which is called stenosis, or instability, which is called spondylolisthesis. And when that becomes symptomatic, when the radiographic finding is symptomatic of either myelopathy, which means spinal cord compression, or radiculopathy, which means nerve root compression, then we start calling that adjacent segment disease. And you can see it on this CT myelogram above the L4 to S1 fusion, that L3-4 segment uh, is significantly narrowed stenosis above an old fusion. And adjacent segment degeneration happens far more commonly at the level above in both the cervical spine and the lumbar spine, far more often the level above than the level below a fusion. And there's probably a biomechanical reason for this. In the cervical spine, most of the operations are done in the mid-cervical region, so around C5-6, plus or minus a level. And the levels above that are where the skull connects to the, to the cervical spine, which is a very mobile area. But the levels below are where the thoracic spine, which is relatively rigid, connects to the spine, so less mobile. And that's why in the cervical spine is probably the levels above. And likewise for the lumbar spine, most of the lumbar work is done at L4-5 or maybe L5-S1. And the apex of that lumbar curvature, the L3-4 segment, is probably the one that has the most biomechanical stress on it, as compared to below the lumbar fusion, which is the, the rigid pelvis. There is a reoperation rate after fusions, both anterior cervical fusion and posterior lumbar fusion. That reoperation rate is between 2 and 2.5% 2 per year. And that's not a very high number, except that it adds up. So if you go out 10 or 20 years, you end up with a fairly significant reoperation rate for adjacent segment degeneration. And occasionally, if you do enough surgeries, I do about 400 cases per year, you're going to get some people coming back in the first year after a big surgery needing another big surgery, which is very discouraging. So why does adjacent segment degeneration happen? There is a change in the biomechanics of the spine when you fuse one segment. Each segment is designed to move a certain number of degrees in each direction. And when you take that motion away with a fusion, you're probably putting more stress on the next level above. And so there's a, there is an obvious biomechanical change to the adjacent level. We also, in surgery, may be disrupting some of the, the support structures to the spine. So the softer things like ligaments, the interspinous ligament, the facet joints, during the operation, during the exposure, or during the decompression portion of the operation, which is called the laminectomy, we may be removing some of those support structures. And removing some of those support structures could introduce instability, and instability causes stenosis. <laughs> 
there are a couple of technical things that we can do in the operation to try to control for this, but there really aren't many. So in surgery, direct damage to an adjacent level would obviously predispose to adjacent segment degeneration down the road. So specifically when we're marking our level in anterior cervical surgery, we get a lateral x-ray with a needle. And if you place that needle in the wrong disc space, then by puncturing that disc space, you can cause it to degenerate. So usually we try to place the needle in a vertebral body to avoid that mistake from happening. When you're placing pedicle screws, if those pedicle screws are not right down the shaft of the pedicle and they breach the superior end plate, they too could puncture the above level disc space and predispose to disc degeneration. And if those pedicle screws are a little bit too medial, too close to the midline, then they could injure the facet joint, the facet joints are the small joints in the back, two at each level. And by damaging the facet joint, they can cause adjacent level breakdown. When we're placing our anterior cervical plates, we know that plates that are placed too close to the adjacent level will also predispose to adjacent segment degeneration in, in anterior cervical surgery. And this may be a biomechanical phenomenon. So in this x-ray, you can see that it looks like that plate is notching the disc space above. But also, there may be some inflammatory changes that occur that cause that above level to wear out. So these are a couple of technical things that we can try to control for in the operation. Risk factors for adjacent segment degeneration. Um, age is, age cuts both ways in this situation. So uh, doing a fusion in a younger person could predispose to the need for reoperation simply because of their longevity. They're expected to live several years and at 2% per year that adds up over the course of their lifetime, a younger person would be much more likely to need another operation. However, older patients who, are, who already have some pre-existing disc degeneration at the proposed level above may also uh, undergo adjacent segment degeneration. Obesity is an obvious one. This is biomechanical, so more stress or more weight on the anterior column of the spine can predispose to disc degeneration. And smoking, which is probably the most easily modifiable of the, all of the risk factors because of the, the microcirculatory effects that uh, smoking has on healing. Sagittal imbalance increases the load on the anterior column or the front of the spine. So in a normal balanced spine, if you're looking from the side, the base of the cervical spine, the base of the neck should be right above the, the sacrum, the pelvis. But as people age, they tend to tilt forward a little bit. So positive sagittal balance, what you're seeing here is called the sagittal vertical axis. If that's in front of the pelvis, that puts more load on the anterior column, which can predispose to degenerative changes. And when we're planning a fusion, there are certain levels that we should avoid stopping. So for example, you would never want to end your fusion in the middle of a scoliosis curve. So what I mean by that is if you have a thoracolumbar fusion, you need to make sure that your fusion extends above and below the curve to capture the neutral vertebrae and not end in the middle because of the asymmetric loading at that level, which can predispose to adjacent level breakdown. We also try to avoid stopping at junctional levels. So particularly the thoracolumbar junction, that's where the T12 in the thoracic spine is more Im uh, immobile due to the rib cage versus the more mobile lumbar spine. So we try to avoid ending a fusion at T12 L1. We'll do our fusions L2 and below, but if we have to extend that fusion up to L1, then in general, we're really going to extend that fusion up to T10 to avoid stopping at the thoracolumbar junction. Because predictably, when we do that, you will have to go back in and extend their fusion for adjacent level breakdown. Interestingly, the number of levels also cuts both ways. In the cervical spine, fewer levels meaning one or two level ACDF as opposed to three or more levels, fewer levels of fusion increases the risk for adjacent segment degeneration, probably because there are more levels left over that can break down. But in the lumbar spine, more levels fused increases the risk for adjacent segment degeneration. And that's probably because of a longer lever arm. So most of the fusions are done at the base of the lumbar, in the lumbar spine are done at the base, L4, L5, and S1 connecting to the pelvis. And now you have a long lever arm at the base of the lumbar spine, and then you have the more rigid thoracic spine and a couple of mobile segments in between. And so that's why uh, more, a longer fusion in the lumbar spine may predispose to adjacent segment degeneration. <laughs>
And then laminectomy above the fusion. So this speaks to removing some of the support structures. So if we do an L4-5 fusion, but we do an L3-5 to laminectomy, that means we're taking some of the support structures away at the level above at L3-4. And this could predispose to adjacent level breakdown, but this puts us in a little bit of a bind knowing this because it's a very common operation to do an L3-5 to laminectomy and an L4-5 to fusion. And so you have to decide, are you not going to do a laminectomy at a level that has stenosis? Of course, the answer is no. Or are you going to do a fusion at a second level that doesn't have instability? Of course, the answer is no. So we kind of accept this scenario in the interest of doing the minimal amount of surgery possible. But we do know that it may be predisposing to another surgery down the road. Interestingly, things that are not risk factors for adjacent segment degeneration. So the approach in spine surgery and fusions, we can approach the spine from the front, the side, the back, or in some combination. And obviously that could have very uh, different changes to the support structures, the soft tissue structures around the spine. But actually the approach does not change the rate of adjacent segment degeneration and also open versus minimally invasive surgery. So minimally invasive surgery is smaller incisions trying to preserve the soft tissue envelope, less soft tissue trauma during your dissection, using x-ray, more reliant on x-ray for a smaller incision. And so you would think that you're preserving more of the soft tissue support structures, but in reality, minimally invasive versus open, which is a traditional exposure, does not reduce the risk of adjacent segment degeneration. So then the question is, does the fusion cause adjacent segment degeneration or are there some intrinsic patient risk factors that are also playing a role? So this is disc degeneration, one of the indignities of aging. And on the top left, you see a normal disc on MRI. It is dark in the periphery, light in the center, and it has a certain height. And then as you go to the right and then into the second row, um, you can see the disc getting darker, collapsing in height, getting fissures, and then you have what's called modic changes, which is end plate changes within the bone. So this is the natural cascade of disc degeneration with time from the top left looking like a young person's disc, like a, a 20 year old, as compared to the bottom right, which looks like my dad's disc herniation. Um, we know from taking people who have absolutely no pain in their neck or their back and getting MRIs of those people that over the age of 60, the vast majority of them will have some degenerative changes even though they're asymptomatic. So as we're looking at our post-op fusions and we're seeing areas of disc degeneration, you also have to accept that some of these people had disc degeneration before, we're going to get disc degeneration anyway, and for a lot of them that may not actually matter. The levels that we tend to operate on also are clustered uh, in the cervical spine. C5-6 is the most common to have surgery, uh, followed by the level above and the level below. So this is also true for which discs are most likely to degenerate in the non-surgical population. So people who have not had a fusion, they still tend to degenerate in the mid-cervical spine and in the uh, lower lumbar spine. So if you do an operation at C5-6, the next most likely level that would degenerate independent of the fusion is C4-5. And likewise, in your lumbar surgery, if you operate at the base of the spine, like at L4-5 or L5-S1, the next most likely disc to degenerate independent of the fusion is the adjacent level. And there is a significant genetic component to disc degeneration. So people, people often ask when they get disc degeneration, like did they do it? Did they cause this somehow by a hard life of heavy lifting or exercise or contact sports or construction work or those types of things? Um, but when we compare twins who are so genetically identical, but who have had completely different occupations, one more sedentary and one more physical, we're able to attribute somewhere between 25 and 70% of the variability in lumbar disc degeneration to genetic influences, nothing to do with their actual physical exposure. So this is relevant to our talk because doing the fusion is physical exposure to new stress on the spine, but some of this is genetic predisposition to begin with. And a lot of patients will develop what's called tandem stenosis. Tandem stenosis means if you have stenosis, narrowing of the spinal canal in the lumbar spine, 
there's a very high likelihood that you will also develop stenosis in the cervical spine. Even though those two regions are separated by several motion segments, people are prone to developing stenosis. And so I bring this up for patients who are not fusion patients, they tend to develop De degenerative changes or stenosis, regardless of whether we put hardware in there to change the biomechanics of the spine. We also know that when we do a laminectomy, so a decompression only procedure, no fusion, no rods or screws, only a decompression, and we're not taking away a motion segment by fusion, there is also a reoperation rate because we're taking away some of those support structures. It can introduce instability. So even without the fusion, laminectomies are still getting reoperated. And if we make the assumption that it is the fusion that's causing adjacent segment degeneration, then it stands to reason that if we could develop implants that avoid a fusion, that we should be able to reduce our risk of adjacent segment degeneration. And so instead of placing rigid cages with pedicle screws, which takes away a motion segment, we've developed these ball and socket joints. There's a cervical arthroplasty and a lumbar disc arthroplasty, thinking that it was going to fix this problem. And the reality, it, reality is it didn't. Even with the mobile bearing joint that we put into the disc space, we still get adjacent segment degeneration. And cervical disc arthroplasty is still commonly done for younger people with a single level soft disc herniation. No one's really doing lumbar disc arthroplasty anymore because those segments tended to fuse anyway, which may be why the adjacent level was, was wearing out. At one point, we were doing flexible rods. So when we place our pedicle screws, we join them by a titanium rod. But we thought if we made it a little bit more flexible, instead of a titanium rod, we use something plastic and flexible that maybe the adjacent level wouldn't break down. And those were really terrible, 50% adjacent level breakdown at four years. So nobody does those anymore. But there was a phase where we were doing those, uh, thinking that it was going to fix this problem. And as I mentioned, alternative, alternative decompression techniques do not reduce the risk of adjacent segment degeneration. So minimally invasive approaches, tubular approaches, which spare all of the soft tissues, you still get adjacent segment degeneration. And I think this is the most compelling evidence regarding the contribution of the fusion versus the contribution of the patient's in inherent or intrinsic risk factors for, for uh, degenerative condition in the spine. When you do a fusion for a non-degenerative condition, so for trauma or the most common one, which is called ismic spondylolisthesis, that's where a pars fracture or spondylolysis develops. Those are people who do not have disc degeneration, but we would fuse them, and typically these are younger people. The reoperation rate at 10 years is 5%, but when we do a fusion for a degenerative condition, so arthritis within the disc space causing stenosis, that reoperation rate of 10 years was 20%. So the exact same hardware, the exact same approach, the exact same fusion construct, when you're doing the fusion for a degenerative condition versus a non-degenerative condition, there's a very significant difference between the rate of adjacent level breakdown. All of that said, I'm not completely without blame in all of this. There's no question we're altering the biomechanics of the spine with the fusion. This is a very special case of adjacent segment degeneration called proximal junctional kyphosis. So when you do a long fusion for scoliosis, so a thoracolumbar fusion, and we end in the mid-thoracic spine, because the thoracic disc spaces don't really move because of the rib cage, instead of developing stenosis or instability at that level, typically we'll get a compression fracture. And so these are people who are not otherwise prone to compression fractures, but it's our biomechanical changes that have caused this to happen. So in conclusion, fusion may increase the risk for adjacent segment degeneration, both the cervical and the lumbar spine. There's no question that we have a hand in all of this. However, there are some significant patient risk factors. The risk factors that predispose someone to needing that first fusion probably predispose them to needing that second fusion as well. And so when you see that perfect L4-5 fusion coming back in a couple of years, needing another level done, uh, it's you kind of take it personally, but it's not necessarily me that kicked over the first domino here. Some of it is the patient-specific characteristics. Thank you.